Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Fifth District Court of Appeal on Election Day. Thank you for coming on this uh, special national uh, day for us. We have three cases today. We'll begin first with case 23-3234, Wolf versus Williams. Counsel, are you prepared? All right. Please approach. May it please the court, uh, my name is Rhonda Bogus, and I have the privilege of representing the appellant, Mr. Wolf, in this matter. Uh, we are here, this is- If I could stop you, Ms. Bogus, um, I thought we made special provision for the time today, but uh, I could be mistaken about that. Uh, was yeah. there not uh, a 10 minute, an extra 10 minutes added? Yes. Okay, yes, I just see 20, so uh, not because to get in Judge Baker's no, way, but <laughs> that's, that's different right. than I think what we ordered. Uh, so, so 30 minutes per side was what we ordered? I, okay. I believe, okay. uh, is that correct? I mean, you don't have to take the whole time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, was that not? It the, is, it's 30 minutes, okay. and then on so, the Appley side, it's divided 20 minutes between the Appley and 10 minutes between the Florida Justice Association. Okay, uh, do you have any rebuttal? I do, I'd like to reserve seven minutes. All right, I think we got it all together, right? All right. Sorry, Judge Maker. No, no please, problem. Thank you. No, I appreciate you bringing that because I, I, I do tend to like to take my time. Um, we are seeking a reversal of a final judgment against Mr. Wolf uh, for numerous issues. Uh, the, one of the primary ones that I do want to speak about is the use of the term defense organization from the very beginning of the trial through the end, from the opening. Uh, PowerPoint presentation to the ending PowerPoint presentation, and I, I think we put in the brief was 48 different times. And the argument that the plaintiff said is this was not inferring liability insurance, this was just getting into the financial bias of the experts. But the financial bias of the experts, if you're asking an expert who gave you August, the let me ask you about that if I may. Um, you would agree that was fair game, financial bias. Absolutely. And your quibble uh, with Judge Anderson was he should not have used this term. He should have used another term. No, it's a little broader than that, Your Honor. Um, Let me, so you think he used the right term? I think you could use the term defense organization if you are asking the very limited question when you have to ask the Bosher question, you know, what um, the financial analysis, the financial relationship between the experts and the defense. But that's not what they did. Well, and, and I, I, I appreciate your candor. Thank you. So on behalf of your clients, you don't believe that term defense organization is radioactive. Just the use of it is not a problem in and of itself. I would, I would struggle if there was, I, I do think there are better terms that can be used that have been suggested in the case law on whether you talk about, um, uh, and I think there were some of them in there, it was, for example, um, you know, the, the people associated with the defense or the defense and its agent or the defendant and its employer, there were some other terms that have been blessed that would be better than defense organization. But I, if there was only two questions, like in the Herrera case, if there were only two questions that said, uh, okay, Mr. Spruance, you've actually been paid such and such amount of money over the last three years by the defendants and defense organizations, I, I would have a hard time arguing that that alone would be enough for a new trial. Because, Why is that? Because there, because you, there is, there has to be a way that they are allowed to ask the financial relationship. Well, so that's, I get the, that. that's the tension here, is it, it is. not? Uh, and it and is you would tension. agree they did not use uh, the name State Farm and right. they did not use insurance company in those questions. They used defense organization or organizations. But what you're saying is they overused? The Absolutely. Term? I mean, there is no reason when you are asking about, if, if an, an expert says that I was given the photos by Mr. Goebel or for the defense law firm, for you to then follow up in your follow-up question and say, so the defense organization gave you these. And there are also questions that they use the term defense counsel and defense organization to make it very clear to the jury that defense counsel is not the same thing as defense organization, and they used it outside of the financial bias scenario. Let me, let me stop you there, Ms. Bogus, but that's true, is it not? I mean, Mr. Goebel yes. is not it State is. Farm. But the fact that we, there was a very limited 
uh, that, that the court has decided that you can get into this very limited financial bias of payments that have been made does not mean that the tripartite relationship and the existence of liability insurance should be a theme. And it is our position that it was a theme. When you look at the opening statements, when you look at the consistent use of the word defense organization apart from the financial relationship, that that was a theme. And the purpose of that theme was to make the jury aware that Mr. Wolf, this young man, had a liability carrier behind him and that he wasn't going to be responsible. And when you add that, <coughs> excuse me, Honor, when you add that to some of the, you don't need to worry about who's going to pay, you know, some of these other things, it was very apparent. Um, and in fact, you know, the trial judge even told jurors, to, told the witnesses to that defense organizations means liability carrier. So well, yes. But that, that, that was wise though, was it not? I mean, did you want uh, Dr. Foley talking about State Farm? There was no problem with Dr. Foley not talking about State Farm, but when you're when an expert is talking about say that about, again, that was a double negative. Right. Do you mean? Do, do you, no, no. When we totally agree, we're not supposed to say State but, Farm. But my, my I, I guess this judge is born. I can't speak for my two esteemed colleagues, but isn't that a good thing for Judge Anderson to make uber sure that Dr. Foley or some other experts not going to talk about State Farm? Well, most most of these experts, if you look at what they were trying, what they were saying, was they would say that defense counsel gave me this or defense counsel provided these records. That's what they were testifying to. What plaintiff used is a finch, kept, in, kept in interjecting into that the fact that there was a defense organization. You know, you've been hired by, the typical question, for example, how often, what is your percentage of time that you provide expert services on behalf of defendants or defendants and those associated with defendants, not defense organizations. So that, and that's just one of the many, many things that they did that we think was inappropriate and designed to prejudice against Mr. Wolf and, and sympathy for uh, the plaintiff. Um, and it's, it's an intentional theme. Most of the cases involving the references, and they're mostly, you know, references to the Bosher financial relationship, make it very clear that if it's only one or two questions, if it's limited, if it's carefully couched and limited so that the jury maybe as one, I think there's a concurring opinion on the 50 CA, one of y'all's decisions that talks about maybe the smart juror will figure out that it's insurance, but the naive one will not. There's no way that a juror here did not understand that there was an insurance company behind these, these, um, these experts. And then when you combine that with the, the inability to cross-examine what retail value was, with the inability to cross- Well, let me ask you about the cross-examination issue. That testimony was never proffered, correct? I would disagree with that. I think there was an offer of proof. If you mean was there a witness called up and question and answer, there was not. Well, that's a proffer. That is one way of doing a proffer. And in fact, this court has said that is not the only way to do a proffer. You also can provide information to the judge so that they, and I think that's the Williams case by this court, that talks about those very different ways. And not only this, this idea that there wasn't a proffer, the trial judge very much knew what was going on. And let me actually, I'll tell you one of the things that he put in there. Um, he actually put, he actually said exactly what was going to be said and what the answers were going to be. And everybody knew that the answer, what the answer was. And the trial judge not only found that it was not, he was not going to allow it because he thought it was speculative, but the trial judge also allowed, said that it was a 9403. Well, how do you do that if you don't know what the substance of the evidence is? This idea that there wasn't a proffer didn't come up until post-trial post-trial when, when the plaintiff's counsel said, oh, your honor, you made a, your decision was correct. Your decision that you made, knowing the substance of the testimony was help, correct. Help, uh, help me understand, was there a request of Judge Anderson to proffer this testimony? Um, to allow, to have the witness called up? No, there was actually statements in there that said, I'm gonna ask him this, he's gonna say this, I'm gonna ask him this, he's gonna say this. And it was very clear that everybody understood what was going on. Um, and there is no case, matter of fact, the Matthews case says you do not have to have the witness stand there and do questioning. And, and, and I know you know this, Ms. Boggess, that in my experience, what I've seen in that situation, well, Judge, I need to make a record. And the way I'm gonna, I need to make this record is I need to put the witness on the stand and ask this witness questions. And then the judge may say, perhaps, uh, no, you don't need to. I understand perfectly what this witness is gonna say. Did that happen here? 
No, what he said is, he said, Your Honor, sir, you're aware there was certainly a world of medical and medical billing, a distinction between what doctors bill and what doctors typically accept. Those are different things, correct. And he's going to have to admit that. And the amount that doctors receive as payment typically is a fraction of or percentage of the amount they bill, right? It was proffered. That's an offer of proof. It's, it's a different, it's an oral proffer by counsel. It also is true that everybody understood, and it was in fact acknowledged, and this has to, has to go with some of the arguments on the 7680427. So, so that, the standard, um, just uh, let's assume it was proffered. Uh, okay. So the analysis tree is then, did Judge Anderson abuse his discretion here? Is that our standard in evaluating that? Yes, as to whether under the cross-examination that it was fair to for allow defendants to explore when, the, when he limited his testimony to retail value, that retail value did not take into account market value, that retail value does not reflect the reality that, patient, that doctors accept more less than what they were. So defense here, here, they're allowed to say, oh, by the way, these numbers are going to go up by inflation. But defense counsel couldn't argue these numbers also don't, rec don't represent market value. These numbers don't represent the fact that doctors accept less. It has to do with the scope of cross-examination, and we do think there was an abuse. Um, I will point to the 5th DCI case, and it basically says that it can be a professional statement by counsel. We do not require that you do a question and answer. The purpose of the proffer is for the court the trial court to understand the significance and the relevance of the information, as well as for this court to understand the significance of the, of the information. And it's pretty clear that what the purpose of and the relevance was, was to basically explain to the jury that this retail cost, financial medical expenses, was an artificial inflated retail cost and did not reflect the reality of a market cost. It didn't reflect the reality that doctors do accept less. And that's proper cross-examination, and that was essential. It was plaintiff's burden to show reasonableness of the medical expenses, and they wanted to cross-examine. Same thing, they did the same thing on the, um, <coughs> excuse me, issues relating to the uh, intake forms of the doctors. Well, counsel, can I interrupt and just rewind the tape and go back to the first issue again on the defense organization matter? I want to clarify something you said. I, I think you said that the trial judge in this case used the phrase liability carrier in defining. Yeah, what, what he defense? actually said. Let me see if I have yeah, that. I want to get it here. right because me, to me, defense organization is kind of a neutral term. Sort of, I'm not really sure what that is. But if the trial judge is defining it as a quote liability carrier, he did. To me, that raises a, a concern because in my mind, a liability carrier obviously that's insurance to me. Right. He, he defined the term. I think it's at 1408. Don't hold me. I, I apologize. I did not write that down on my notes. I think Please, it's at on 1408. Reply, on rebuttal, you can bring it back up. But. Okay. <laughs> um, but yes, he actually did, in fact, have a, have a colloquy and basically say, okay, you're getting ready to testify. Plaintiff's counsel is going to use the term defense organization to mean State Farm and other liability carriers. And then they go forward. It was a blessed term. It was an understood term. You're, you're not saying that happened in front of the jury. No. I'm not, but what I'm saying is everybody in that courtroom, and I would submit the jury, knew that that continuous use of the word defense organization meant and liability we, we appreciate your argument, Ms. Boggess, but I, I, and I, I, Judge Makar can speak for himself, but what you just told him about a liability carrier or li a liability insurer, that was all outside the presence of the jury. It was, but it reflected what, how the witness actually testified. The witness used the term defense organization because, again, witnesses listen to judges, and that's what he was told that that was the term. So it even heightened the prejudice. Um, but well, was, it, was this in a motion for was this in a motion for limine, or I'm just trying to get the context? You said it was outside the presence of the jury. How did it come up? That well, it continued to come up because throughout the trial, uh, there was uh, continuous objections to the use of defense organization, as well as at least two mistrials, motion for mistrials for that. It was a continuing issue, and before, I think it was after Mr. Spruance and before the next expert came up, it was, the, it was a conversation um, probably by the judge to continue not having these continuous objections in relation so, to what So the defense. judge knew what they were saying. Oh, but, yeah, but, everyone but the, knew what But they the were jurors saying. weren't made everyone. privy to this discussion. No, the jurors did not hear it. What the jurors heard from the opening PowerPoint presentation to the end 
was that these witnesses were hired by defendants and defense organizations. And that's what they heard throughout. They heard their witnesses were not working for defense organizations. I mean, this were, you know, typically you would say, what percentage of your cases do you do for plaintiffs or defendants? That's not what they did here. This was all intentional. This is not a minor one or two comments that just happened to come in. This was the theme. Um, so I do think it was prejudicial. I do think that even the naive jurors realized it was liability insurance. And I think particularly in this type of case, this is what you end up with is a very high, high threshold. Um, so we have, we have that issue. We have the fact that the closing argument, and I would suggest you look at the PowerPoint of the, of the opening argument, and it looks like a closing argument. I mean, it does. It's very argumentative. You've got defense organization in there. You've got it's the value of human life. No, this case is not over the value of human life. This case is over what damages were caused by this accident. That's prejudicial. Well, they don't use that term. They use the value of human well-being, correct? You're right. You're, I, you're, you're correct. It is value of human well-being. Um, and and that's, that's different than true is value it? of life argument. I, I don't think that the, the picture that shows the scale that has the value of human well-being and damages that is not what the jury is being asked to calculate. The jury instructions do not say you are to determine the value of the human well, human well being. They were supposed to determine what damages were caused, what past medical expenses, what reasonable, you know, reasonably certain future medical expenses. And yes, there is intangible damages in there, but those intangible damages are uh, have instructions, and they're not designed to just be you know, the value of, his, of the human life and the human well-being and all that. They, I know it's an amorphous standard, but it still is a standard. Um, and there's a reason that the cases talk about we, don't, we, we are not valuing somebody's life. And, and to me, I think that is what they're doing on that. Um, so you've got all those prejudice. I did want to go back also to the cross-examination of the doctors as well. This is another one where, again, they say that there wasn't a proper uh, again, this is something that came up post-trial, not during trial. Um, and this is one where it's even, it's, we want questions on two forms that are in the record that we all can see. The forms were proffered. Uh, we know that, the, and certainly if the doctor says, oh no, that's not my form, <laughs> you know, we had an issue, but they're not going to say that. That was their form. Are you referencing the two intake forms? Yes, sir. Okay. And those are the two intake forms. One was a subject of an order in limine, that was Dr. Main, and then there's also one that was discovered during trial. And both of those again, and defense counsel wanted to be able to explore those because they basically showed that these causation opinions that were formed on that first visit were with knowledge that this was a uh, person who was, had already retained. Doesn't the Worley case clearly kind of cover that issue? The Worley case? I absolutely disagree. I totally disagree. And why is disagree. that? Because you're not talk the Worley's dealing with getting information from the uh, from the client or from the attorney as to whether there was a referral to a doctor. The fact that then what we're dealing with is an intake form where the plaintiff coming in to see a doctor tells them I have retained an attorney. There's nothing about a referral. In fact. There are no LOPs in this case. There is no, there is, there's no um, referral. There's a statement in the trial court that there's actually no referral in this one. This was not a privileged communication. The fact that somebody has an attorney is not privileged. The fact that the client told somebody, and let's assume even if it is, the fact that the client told a doctor that, that they had counsel is also not privileged. And if it's privileged, it's been waived. This is not the, confidential communication between a, the plaintiff and the defendant uh, and, and the plaintiff as to whether to go to this doctor. This is just a simple knowledge of the, that this doctor knew uh, that at the time that the, plain, the plaintiff went in that she was, she was represented by counsel. And the real reason, one of the reasons, and defense counsel articulated this to the trial judge, is these, one of the doctors, I think it's Dr. Silva, was like, well, I don't know how many percentage of my practice is made up of, of uh, people seeking um, um, automobile crash injury claims. I don't know that. But he had an intake form. He had a standard intake form that asked, have you retained an attorney for this, for this accident? And defense counsel wanted to be able to bring that to the jury's attention 
as something for them to take into account when evaluating the credibility of this doctor. And again, they were deprived from that issue. Um, so that was another one. So we've got all these different limited, limited cross-examination questions combined with all the prejudice related to defense organization, the argumentative uh, opening. There was a, uh, also a mistrial. There was a, a statement that we had suggest was vouching um, that we had to determine, um, you know, bef before we came to trial, we had to determine were the injuries that she is claiming caused by this motor vehicle crash, um, that that was vouching. There was a, a mistrial on that one. Um, there, this was a this is a very unusual case in that there are <laughs> there are four mistrials that are actually at issue in this case. There are it is it is to say it's preserved is an understatement. It is throughout the trial continuous objections that were overruled, um, and we would suggest that that resulted in a, an unfair um, unfair verdict, unfair trial. Did want to bring up the the issue five. Um, which is the 7680427. And I su respectfully suggest that perhaps the, the, the FGA brief is, is bringing up issues that really are not before this court. I just want to, so as an appellant, the issue came up on a motion in limine as to the presentation to trial as to past and future medical expenses only. Um, it was heard at trial. So the posture at that time was that, and in fact, the court said, okay, if I say that this applies, what does, it, what does this do? How is this going to, you know, we're at trial. So if I say the statute applies, what is it? And the answer was that it would allow evidence in the amount of payments made on behalf of the health insurer and evidence as to, excuse me, the Medicare analysis into the future. That's all that was asked um, because of the procedural posture of this trial, those were the only two issues, which is really like subsection two of, of 760. So is uh, your client's position that HB 837, 768.0427 uh, applies retroactively to this case? I take it, it applies to this case, but not because it's retroactive, because retroactivity only applies when you're talking about a substantive position. It is our position that it is a procedural law, and because it's a procedural law, it, the, the presumption is it applies to every litigation after the effective date, and that you don't have to do the retroactive analysis. It is. It does, the, does the legislature have the constitutional authority to say when a law takes effect? It, it can, it, no. I mean, that, that. It does not. Well, to, when it takes effect, but not whether, and it did. It said, and it takes effect. So we're saying it took effect and it's procedural. Um, and, and, and the legislature applies. said that, that, right. that it took effect on this specific right. day. It does. And I, I misspoke. What I meant is they do not have the right to, or they can express their intent as to retroactivity. But that ultimately is a decision for the court as to whether a retroactive, something should be applied retroactive. What I'm saying. Well, isn't that a separation of powers issue? I mean, for us to get in the legislature's business, the legislature has told us that this will take effect on a certain day at a certain time. And then we're going to uh, back engineer this to say it, it applies to cases that um, causes of action that accrued before. The day no, I, the I would suggest that under, first off, under La Fere, it's for the court to decide whether something is prospective, whether it is a procedural, remedial, or substantive matter. It's also for the court to decide if it's a substantive matter, what the legislative intent was in terms of retroactive effect. That ultimately is a court decision. That's the La Fere decision and others, also in love. But if you look, but there also- Is it our decision to say when it took effect? Well, we know when it took effect. The law's in effect. It's whether it applies to this litigation. And if it's a procedural, the law is very clear that if shall, it's- Shall apply to causes of actions filed after the effective date. Uh, what, what, what do you make of that, Ms. Bogus? I, my personal opinion is that that means that it, it, there is an intent there to apply certain, re, certain things retroactively. Um, the, where, where is that in the language I Because the, and again, I, that's, this is a little different than the SAP decision. When you say it applies to all cause of actions that, that were brought, it's not causes of action that accrued, it's cause of actions that brought. The statute of limitations only applies to, um, 
things that causes of action after the effective date. Um, what I'm, but, but the general provision is it well, is an I, effect I, I, on I, the I, date. I, that's try that. as I might, I, I'm having trouble understanding. I, it shall apply to causes of action filed. Right. after the effective date of this act. Are you, you saying this action was not filed? Or this action was filed after the no, effective date? No, I am date? not. I'm not. So, I so am taking what, the what position. Do we do with that? What do we do with filed after? Well, that is, that is the legislature's, that is an, an intent expressed by the legislature and to provide guidance on the substantive portions and whether they are to be applied retroactively, and if so, to what extent. Um, but what we're dealing with is a provision, and the law is clear also, that you look at each subsection, look at LaFerre, look at the Crane decision, that you look at each subsection of the act and you determine is that procedural. If it's procedural, it applies. If it's procedural, it applies, and you don't have to go to the legislative intent. If it's substantive, then it doesn't apply um, because of that provision that you just cited, because this action was brought after the um, after that after the, the effective date, um, but we also have the provision that says that is the effective date. But I think my point, one of the things, and I'm a little concerned, and I'm seeing in my rebuttal, is that we're getting uh, the, a lot of the arguments that are presented. I, I have to say, were not really before the court, because the only thing that was asked for was the application to what evidence could be brought in on the past and future medicals. Um, and some of these other issues, I was trying to like. I agree it was relevant to that though. This new provision was relevant to that issue. Yes, it was. And that's why there was a motion to eliminate and request to be able to bring in the medical insurance for the past and also to ask Mr. Spruance to deal with Medicare reimbursement rates on the future. That is the extent of what it was before the court. So, um, you know, I'd be glad to address some of the other issues that have been brought up by the FGA, but I am. That the only issue that was actually litigated was that specific one, and it's our, it's our position that that was just a procedural one, and under the well-established precedent of the Florida Supreme Court, press, uh, procedural laws apply once they're effective, and it's effective, you know, it was an effective law at the time that this, this, this trial went in, and it's solely for that reason. We're not dealing with the other provisions of the tour format. I'd like to reserve the remaining part from rebuttal. Thank you. Thank you. Council. So just to clarify, you'll have 20 minutes and your co-counsel will have 10, correct? That's correct, Your Honor. Uh, may I please court? Uh, I'd, I'd like to begin uh, with a question that you actually asked Judge Makar, um, which is how did the term defense organization arise in context of trial? I attended all of the days of trial. Um, and I can tell you exactly how it came up. Um, this colloquy between the experts and the court came up outside the presence of the jury each time an expert witness was called to the stand to explain to that expert witness the term that we were going to be using in lieu of insurance companies. That was never brought up in front of the jury. Um, and uh, it was not something uh, that the jury was ever cognizant of. So. To, I, I think it is incorrect, um, based on the record, to um, suggest that the jury was aware that defense organizations stood for insurance company. What, what I hear you saying, though, is that behind the scenes, with not the jury present, everyone understood that it was insurance companies. That's correct, Your Honor. Okay, because, so um, and, and this is what I want to get to, which is uh, Vasquez and Herrera. Um, because. Uh, in Vasquez, this court held that it is proper to inquire um, into bias of an expert based on payments made by an insurance company. But as your honors are very aware, we can't bring up the existence of liability insurance in front of the jury. So the question is, what term do we use? And this term uh, in Vasquez, the term that was held not to imply insurance was the defense or its agents. Um, in Herrera, uh, it was the defense counsel's employer. So the courts have made allowance for this type of code, if you will, to be used with experts so that experts can properly answer Bosher impeachment questions without the jury being made aware of the issue of liability insurance. And that's exactly what occurred in this case. Um, we've heard frankly from the defense and the court is aware 
the term liability assurance was never made or referenced in front of the jury. What about when you use the term defense organization along with statements like in closing? It's not about who, it's not about who pays. You don't have to worry about who pays or if it will ever get paid. That's a point the appellant makes. Doesn't that then start getting into the area of talking about liability insurance? Um, Your Honor, uh, no, and let me explain why. Um, the only way that the, that the appellant makes that argument is improperly stringing together comments that were made in different contexts. Uh, a uh, mode of appellate argument that the Supreme Court has specifically condemned. The argument of you don't worry about who pays the judgment or if it ever gets paid is proper. And we cite the cases for that in our brief, which are Kaskinet and Hollenbeck. Um, those types of terms in the Nikesi case, which we cite in our papers, um, was observed by at least one court to, number one, not imply insurance, and number two, to be innocuous. So that argument about who pays the, or who doesn't pay, or if it ever gets paid, completely proper. And in fact, um, it ties in with the standard jury instructions, that the jury is only supposed to consider the evidence. In different contexts, at different parts of both opening and closing, or in witnesses, the term defense organization is used. To be very, very clear, because this has come up both in the initial brief and the reply brief, we never said, either implicitly or explicitly, that a defense organization would be paying this verdict. That never happened. And I would encourage you to look through both openings and closings, because that did not occur. Um, Let me ask you what I asked Ms. Boggess. Isn't that part of the difficulty for the trial judge, knowing what Herrera says, knowing what Vasquez says, that there is an entitlement to cross-examine these experts about payments from insurance companies? So how do you refer to that? And the choice here by Judge Anderson was defense organization organizations. Herrera had a different term, Vasquez had a different term, but that's, that's part of what the trial judge has to do, correct? Correct. And come up with that term without talking about what it was, which is an insurance company. Your Honor is exactly right. And in fact, this court in Vasquez praised the trial court and how it adeptly handled that issue by using this type of code. And we did the exact same thing. There's absolutely no legal support for the proposition that the use of the term defense organization is improper. And let me just deal with this because it was an issue that was brought up in both briefs and then at this, at this podium. If a term is not improper, if a term is correct and within the bounds of the rules that is allowable by the case law, it does not become improper through repetition. If the term defense organization was proper the first time it was used, it was proper the 48th time it was used. So what I hear you saying is if the plaintiff, plaintiff's attorneys uh, used defendant and used it serially through a trial 100 times, it's proper and they could use it 100 times. Now the jury might get tired of hearing it, but there's nothing untoward uh, about that. That is exactly right, Your Honor. And, and you bring up an interesting point. This is something else I want to touch on, which is that we could have said something else. Well, the fact that there may be another proper term we could have used doesn't make defense organization improper. There's just simply two different ways we may have referred to this. So, so to understand what you just told us, the rapidity of something that is not improper is not, it doesn't become uh, reversible error just by virtue of it being used a lot. That's right. And I would like to just uh, touch on one other thing on this topic because, again, it was brought up. Um, yes. Um, the, the, the suggestion was made that even the most naive jury, juror would have known that defense organization meant liability insurer. If that is the case, that can't be squared with the factual record. If it was the case that that term was so obvious that even the most naive person would have understood that, then why in front of each expert witness that testified did the court feel the need to bring that witness in outside the presence of the jury and explain what we were doing? 
Well, help me work through this a little bit because I see two issues here. If there's examination of an expert witness to show bias in favor of you know, plaintiffs or so forth and they take insurance company payments and so on and so forth, the mention of insurance in that context, in, in my mind, is not what's prejudicial. What's prejudicial is the other issue, which is I thought that you can't mention insurance because you don't want the jury to know that in this case, there's insurance to cover the judgment. In other words, we don't want them to be biased by saying, oh yeah, we'll just enter a judgment, have a judgment for the plaintiff, because the plaintiff has insurance. One doesn't infer the other. Just because an expert's being cross-examined because he or she had been taking payments from insurance companies on one side of the, the aisle, doesn't infer that there's actually insurance in this case, does it? I, I would totally agree with the court. Um, just because, and I think that is why Bosher um, type bias impeachment of experts is allowable. Yeah. Um, well, right, I get that, but I, mean, I guess maybe, I, maybe I'm making your case, which is to say that they could have used insurance and talked about it in the, in the context of cross-examining an expert, but they uh, can't do it in trying to infer that there's actually insurance available in this particular case. That's right, and, and, and uh, terms like defense organization or the defense and its employer or the defense and its agents have been approved to walk that line. And that's the line the trial court walked. And in light of the case law and what happened factually in this case, it just simply is not an abuse of discretion. Um, and with the court's indulgence, um, I'll move on. Uh, the issue of the cross-examination of Dr. Spruance. And here we need to get to the issue of preservation and first principles, um, because there's a disagreement about that. Uh, the preservation of an evidentiary issue for appellate review is based on 90.104, and uh, error can be predicated upon the exclusion of evidence, and that term is important. And in order for this court in its appellate capacity to predicate error on the exclusion of evidence, it must know the substance of the evidence through proffer or, or in some rare cases, context. 90.104 does not deal with questions, which are the precursors to evidence, it deals with evidence. And this court, in order to know whether or not excluded evidence is relevant or admissible, must know what the evidence is. And in case after case, which we have cited in our briefs, this court and the Supreme Court, when it comes to testimony, means that What do you do with Ms. Boggess' argument? She just made it, you heard it, uh, that Judge Anderson knew all that, and that's the way he went through the algorithm of weighing the probative value versus the prejudice. And if he didn't know it, he, he couldn't have made that analysis. Um, there, are, there are two answers to this. Um, one, um, what occurred and what was quoted to you was rhetorical assumption on the part of defense counsel. I'm gonna ask this question, he's gonna to have to admit it. Quite frankly, Mr. Goebel doesn't know that. He didn't know it at trial. He was asking the judge to assume that. He cited no deposition testimony, no deposition testimonies in front of the court, and there's absolutely no factual record that the assumption that he was making and he was asking the trial court to make was actually correct. So what's occurring here? So, so what I, I mean, and that undercuts the argument that uh, potentially that uh, Mr. Spruance was not even going to say what Mr. Goble thought he was going to say. Right, and and then above and beyond that, if we go but, out, but if that's true, then we needed a proffer. We needed a proffer, and let's assume that we get past that first hurdle, uh, Your Honor. Then what basis does this court have? to review the decision of Judge Jay. Judge Jay made a 9403 ruling. This court needs to make a determination substantively uh, if, if that is correct. In order to do that, it has to have some record. It has to have something that shows the substance of the evidence excluded. And let me give you an example of why it can't be done. They wanted to put in testimony that some unspecified doctors, for unspecified reasons, would accept a fraction of what they bill as payment for medical services rendered. Objections are raised to that. 9403, collateral source. 
what record does this court have to do that 94 or 3 balancing test at this point? It has none because it doesn't know what Dr. Spruance was going to say. And so there is simply, that issue has not been preserved. One other point I want to make on this. We have cited carefully and laid out before this court a number of this court's decisions and the Supreme Court's decisions on preservation. They, they in their briefing, do string sites without any context, quotations, or holdings, and that's intentional because their cases are all either distinguishable and some don't even deal with preservation at all. For instance, in the Palace case that they cite, the holding in that case was that there was no preservation. They rely on one phrase of dicta. In Petrusky, preservation was accomplished because the court had deposition testimony in the record. In Williams, Williams is a case about uh, arbitrarily cutting off voir dire, an arbitrary timelet for voir dire case has nothing to do with preservation of evidence. The Cook case that they cite is about the burden, for uh, the, the proffer burden, for amending to add punitive damages to a complaint. It's not an evidentiary case either. They simply have no answer to the string of preservation cases we cite. And that leads us to Drs. Silver and Mann. Um, the same preservation arguments apply, but there's two added principles. One is this case, or this court's decision in Shaw. They say the court knew exactly what was going to happen because it had the intake forms. In Shaw, this court had an arrest affidavit in front of it. The arrest affidavit suggested that the girlfriend, not the defendant, owned the drugs. The court said this document foreshadows what the witness may have said, but we don't know what they actually would have said. That's still speculation because they never proffered the testimony. So they want to use this intake form as their basis for saying, well, the court knew what it was going to say. That is directly rejected in Shaw. There we don't know what Dr. question uh, Judge Boatwright asked Ms. Boggess uh, about Worley's effect on these intake forms. Uh, what, what says the appellee about that? Uh, would Worley uh, be a valid basis to keep out those intake forms? Judge, War uh, Judge Boatwright was absolutely correct. Um, and what has been ignored um, by the appellant in its initial and reply briefs is the operative language in, Boat in Worley. Um, Worley does, as one of its bases for holding that there is restrictions on bias impeachment of treaters, is attorney-client privilege. But we have a quote from Worley, which is a second basis for why they didn't allow this. It's on page 38 of our brief. I'm going to read it because it's very important. And, and we certainly want to hear it, but you would agree this was not attorney-client privilege. No, this is not attorney-client privilege, but in fact, I'm going to forbear to read it for the purposes of time. But what they say, you can read it, it's 38, page 38 of our brief, that the reason why we're not going to allow discovery into any quote-unquote cozy relationships between plaintiffs and treating physicians is because of the chilling effect that will have on treating physicians participating in our legal system, and we don't want to do that. And so that was another basis for not allowing um, the kind of full panoply, panoply, panoply of, um, of Bocher-type Bocher impeachment when it comes to treating physicians. And above and beyond Worley, there is the Beleza case. And the Beleza case is directly on point. In Beleza, there was attorney references in the medical records, which the defense wanted to bring out. The, defense, the court, relying on Worley, said, that's not admissible. Beleza and Worley are directly on point. And even if we get past preservation for Drs. Silver and Mann, substantively, what they wanted to do was not allowable. Um, the improper arguments. In, in this case, I'm going to rely mostly on our briefing. What about, the, what about the statement made calling the plaintiff a victim and then the statement, she stuck with this for a crime she didn't commit? Aren't, 
Weren't you saying that Mr. Wolf committed a crime in this case? Um, so, Your Honor, in, in all honesty, I don't believe that that was said. Um, and that was, that was the statement made in closing, though, correct? The, the statement made in closing is that she's sitting here stuck with the consequences of a crime she didn't commit. That was a statement made. Um, but let's assume that that type of, that that argument was made and the, and the objection was objectionable and improper. Let's assume that for the sake of the statement. Was the statement. curative instruction enough to fix that? That's exactly right. So the court, the question then becomes at that point, what is the trial court supposed to do? And the answer to that is found in the Jennings case, which we cite in our brief. Generally speaking, the use of a cur curative instruction to dispel the prejudicial effect of an objectionable comment is sufficient. So in order to prevail, they would have to show that he, that Judge Anderson abused his discretion in handling that issue exactly like the courts have told him to handle that issue. In other words, in the teeth of all of this case law, and this is to invoke the terminology used by the courts in abuse of discretion, they would have to show that no reasonable judge would have given a curative instruction and that any reasonable judge would have recognized that a mistrial was an absolute legal necessity and given one, they make no serious effort to make that showing. They just make a fiat argument. It was incurable because we say it's incurable. That's not enough to carry their burden. Um, Your Honor, um, on, I'm just gonna touch briefly on these because they were brought up in, in argument. Vouching has a specific de definition. It's when counsel expresses a personal opinion about the honesty or believability of a witness. Even the out-of-context uh, phrase which they quote doesn't, rate, doesn't meet that burden. Um, and when you read it in context, it certainly doesn't. Um, the value of human life. Um, we never made a value of human life. That has two defining characteristics. One, asking the court to place a value on life, which under the Wil Wilbur case, which this court has cited, is different than the value of loss. We didn't ask the jury to place a value on life. We asked them to place a value on their intangible damages in, as encapsulated by the use of the term well-being. And that's proper. And the second definition defining characteristic is also missing because we didn't ask them to compare it to some sort of priceless artifact, which is another defining characteristic of those cases. Now, um, I'm into my colleagues' time, so unless the court has any other questions of me, um, I will conclude. I assume your argument on the statutory issues as set forth in your brief and that you're not entirely um, turning over the argument. That is correct. And, and you know, I would, if, if the court wants to question me on that, I will. I kind of read the court's uh, order previously as uh, wanting to hear from me on the first four issues, uh, but I'm certainly prepared to address that if you would like me to. That's Otherwise, whatever, we rely whatever on you papers. all want to do. I just want to make sure that you're not sort of just deferring to uh, the. No, I'm, I'm plenty happy to rely on my papers uh, on that issue, Judge Maker. Right, Thank you. Good morning. May it please the court. Dimitri Pettivess for the Amicus Curiae, the Florida Justice Association. I'll be addressing the fifth issue, which is the retroactive application of uh, 7680427 Florida statutes. And there are three primary arguments I'd like to make. And those are one, that the legislature has the power to decide the temporal applicability of its own laws. And that uh, power comes from the Constitution? Correct. And there's actually a specific provision on point. It's Article 3, Section 9 of the Florida Constitution. And it says, each law shall take effect on the 60th day after adjournment, signed I, of the session of the legislature, which enacted, or as otherwise provided therein. So that provision of the Constitution recognizes that the legislature can provide in a law when the law should apply. 
So that's, that's the first argument. The second argument uh, is that here the legislature did just that. In section 30 of the act, the legislature made very clear its intent that this law shall apply to cases filed after the effective date of the act. And then my third point is that any contrary uh, construction would raise constitutional concerns. Well, let me ask you this. Um, let's assume that this law we're looking at today uh, is clearly procedural, okay? Clearly procedural. Yet the legislature in the statute says, well, it'll only be operative prospectively. But we know that the court has held, the Florida Supreme Court, that procedural laws apply across the board to all cases, whether it's prospective or retroactively. So can the legislature take away that power? So uh, I, I disagree with your characterization of the Florida Supreme Court's case law. It hasn't held that procedural laws always apply um, retroactively. What it's created is a set of dueling presumptions. So it's just a presumption, and a, a opposing counsel used that same term. So if it's substantive, you presume it applies prospectively. If it's procedural, you presume it applies to pending cases. But like any presumption, a presumption is defeated by contrary intent. And here we have this clear intent in the uh, act that the legislature's given us to defeat this presumption. And we have uh, case law from this very court acknowledging that. Um, for example, but what if, it's, what if it's a substantive law? Can the legislature say, well, we're going to apply this retroactively? Yes, and there's, there's cases that talk about that. You do a two-step test. First, you look at what has the legislature said. And then if it's clearly said we want to apply this retroactively, then the court starts looking at constitutional concerns, like would this violate due process to apply this law retroactively? Okay, so the substantive procedural uh, dichotomy is essentially a judicial creation. Exactly. There's nothing in the Constitution. You, you won't find those, that test in there. It's just something that courts... Well, you, you will find that the Florida Supreme Court has the power to enact rules and so forth to deal with procedure, and the yeah. legislature can overrule them and so forth at a two-thirds vote or whatever. Uh, but there, These presumptions, But the yeah. test that has evolved is a judicial creation. Correct. And it, it just stems from the fact that generally laws um, operate prospectively and you know courts should read laws to avoid constitutional concerns so that's why they created this dueling presumption system um, it's not some constitutional command there's nothing in the constitution that says the legislature cannot decide the temporal applicability of a law if it's procedural and that also wouldn't make sense because then some parts of the law that were substantive would apply on a certain date, and then some parts of the law that are procedural would apply on a different date. Is Section 30 procedural? So S Section 30 is just the part of the Act that says when the Act applies. Um, so I, I don't think it matters whether it, it's procedural or substantive. I, I guess it is procedural, it, but it, Section 30 isn't even it's not even in a statute. It's just part of the law, the, the session law, that says when it shall take effect. Um, there's other parts of it, too. There's a section 28 and 29 also talk about. What about Ms. Bogus's argument that we have a narrow band of controversy here as far as what part of this law actually applies to this case? Uh, is the position of the amicus uh, consistent with that? Yeah, so the HB 837 did a lot of things. Here we're only talking about one of the statutes it created, 7680427, and it seems we're only talking about one subsection of that statute too. They weren't very clear about that in their filings below, but it seems we're talking about subsection two of the statute because what they asked for in their motion of, in limine was to limit the introduction of evidence to what's allowed under the statute. And so they seem to be talking about subsection two. They wanted to get in um, evidence of collateral source payments. They wanted to get in evidence of Medicare uh, eligibility. And these things the Florida Supreme Court has said is not admissible. But they, they were trying to say, well, this statute now applies. And the statute lets us get this stuff in. But um, the legislature has told, told us that this statute applies to cases filed after the effective date. 
This case was not filed after the effective date. It was filed before. So the, the text seems pretty clear. So the whole premise of their argument really rests on this notion that the legislature doesn't have power to decide the own applicability of its laws or that a court can change what the legislature has said. And there's a case law in point that says, no, courts can't do that. We cited the uh, INRI Florida Evidence Code on page 15 of the amicus brief. And that was a case where uh, the evidence code said it was going to apply to causes of action arising after a certain date. And the Florida Supreme Court said, well, we really think it would be better if it applied to all pending cases. And in fact, the bar had requested the Florida Supreme Court to do that. But the Florida Supreme Court said, we don't have the authority to do that unless we find the entire law to be procedural. And that's because the Florida Supreme Court has exclusive rulemaking authority over procedural matters. So the only way it could change the applicability provision of a law was if it was entirely procedural. So it was something that was within the Florida Supreme Court's purview. But HB 837 is not entirely procedural. There's substantive elements to the law. For example, the law um, creates a rights to attorney's fees, which courts have uh, recognized as a substantive matter, the entitlement to attorney's fees. Um, so there you have Florida Supreme Court holding recognizing that it can't change what the legislature has said about one of its own laws. Um, with the limited time I have left, I do want to say that if this court were to rule otherwise and find that you know, the legislature can't decide what, when this law applies or we think the text isn't clear and that this statute does apply retroactively, then there are constitutional concerns. Um, that's because if a statute conflicts with a Florida Supreme Court decision on a matter of procedure, then it violates the Florida Supreme Court's rulemaking authority. And here we have multiple conflicts. The statute conflicts with decisions on the collateral source rule. As I mentioned, they were trying to get in evidence of insurance payments. Under the Florida Supreme Court's decision on the collateral source rule, that evidence is not admissible. They were also trying to get in evidence of Medicare eligibility. And again, under the collateral source rule cases, that evidence is not admissible. So we have a direct conflict between the statute. This court doesn't need to address that, doesn't need to reach that if it agrees with the trial court that this doesn't apply retroactively. But if it does disagree with the trial court, it would need to reach those constitutional issues. And then finally, I, I'll ask this court to please write an opinion on this issue. Um, this issue has been addressed by many trial judges. Um, by my last count, 120 trial judges have ruled that this doesn't apply retroactively but a small subset, seven judges, have ruled that it does. And this issue keeps coming up in trial courts. So if this court writes an opinion on, it, on this, that will bind all the trial courts in the state, and that will stop um, parties from having to repeatedly litigate this. Unless this court has any questions, I see my time has expired. Thank you, counsel. Thank you. With it, in addressing the issue of defense organization, we've been talking about um, whether that's an a, a okay term for use of financial bias, but the real concern is not, it is the overriding principle that everyone agrees with, and plaintiffs does not take issue, is that liability insurance is not supposed to be something that is part of the analysis of the juror, that it, it, it causes prejudice, it causes a finding of liability, it's more likely to uh, result in a higher verdict. And, and so the, the idea that we have this limited area in which, in which plaintiffs are allowed to deal with the financial relationship and the financial bias between the expert and insurance companies uh, that have, the insurance company that hired the attorney and is defending the insurer, does not negate that entire principle that liability insurance is not supposed to be a feature. And therefore, the use of that term and to take that small section of financial bias and to expand that 
through opening, through closing, through conversations on every single, even their own witnesses, when it's really questions and they say, oh, we criticize because you, you use the firm defense organization instead of attorney. Yes, we did. Because if somebody says, if a witness says, I was given this by Mr. Goble, and the follow-up question is, oh, so you were given this by a defense organization, that's an issue. That's intentional. And the, and the intentional, repetitive use of the term defense organization and the questioning that made it clear the defense organization was different than the defense attorney and from the law firm, that was prejudicial. But it in here it was. It was different. And so we come back to what I asked you in the beginning. How do we reflect that in a jury trial? I mean, we, well, we know Mr. Goble right. is not State Farm. We know Mr. Goble is not a defense organization. We know Mr. Goble, um, I know what Herrera said, but I don't think he works for State Farm. So right. how, how, how does a trial judge you limit Characterize it. that. You limit it to the financial bias questions, the Bosher questions. That's what you do. And you don't allow it to be a feature of the trial, and you don't allow over objections the use to be used in contexts that have absolutely nothing to do with financial bias. Every one of the decisions, the Herrera, the, the Nikes, I don't know how you say that, Vasquez decision, they talk about adeptly, Vasquez actually says, adeptly prevented, that, that the judge adeptly permitted evidence of poss possible bias without it being a feature of the trial. This was not, with all due respect to the trial judge, adeptly limited. This was the one of the main features of the trial. I also want to address the proffer issue. I would submit that if the decision of this court is you have to do a question and answer on every one when everybody knows the substance and there is no debate as to the fact that retail's market, well, that, I, would be, I just, that would be I, new. I, I just, and you heard it too, Ms. Boggess. He said we, we didn't know what Dr. Is it Dr. Spruance or Mr. Spruance? Mr. Spruance. Mr. Spruance. Um, we don't, we didn't, didn't know what Mr. Spruance was going to say. Um, and so um, how in that situation can we evaluate it without a proffer? Because everybody, and, 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 the, and it's very clear, in fact, that's why we have 768042, everybody, the judge, the defense counsel, and the plaintiff's attorney, all recognize that the answer to that was that, that the amount paid to, to, to uh, medical providers was in fact less than what, what the retail value is. Um, and we're talking also about cross-examination questions as well. To a but certain order, extent, the ability to cross-examine him on what market value is but was something that should be allowed. But for us to understand and evaluate, and I know we've gone over the time, Judge Maycar, I think it'll let me finish this question, I hope so. Um, but uh, in order for us to evaluate how bad it was, wouldn't we need to know what the differential was there of what Mr. Spruance was going to say? It doesn't matter what the percentage is. The, 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 why, why wouldn't it? Because the argument is that you, jury, in determining what the reasonable valuation is, because again, they weren't going to submit what the numbers were. All they wanted was to cross-examine, to say, your testimony as to retail value does not take into account the market value does not take into account that Dr. Cecilia. If more. the retail value was three cents less, then that might be a non-issue. But if it was dramatically less, it again, this is cross-examination. The purpose is to point out the the inconsistent, the limitations of the testimony, and it was and it was very important to point out the limitations of the testimony of Mr. Spruance's testimony, which was critical. And I I'm gone over, so thank you very much. And we do request a yeah, reversal. I'll give you 15, 20 seconds to wrap up if you. Want to just okay. make a final statement. Um, again, there are so many issues. I do feel like that I've, that I've jumped from some of them, but it's really almost a cumulative error. There are so many situations in which the prejudicial and sympathetic things were allowed by the plaintiff. Cross-examination was prohibited by the defense. You have the, the victim of a crime comment. You have the vouching. And for all those reasons, we request reversal. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, counsel. Thank you both. Thank all you. All three of you. Thank yeah, you. well presented on both sides.